So I'm here today with Hilary Wainwright. She is an activist, a sociologist, a feminist, and a great thinker about uh, public accountability, uh, participation, democracy. Um, Hilary has advised Ken Livingston. She's the co-editor of Red Pepper um, and a fellow of the Transnational Institute. Um, and this book, A New Politics from the Left, is Hillary's latest book, which we're going to be talking about today. And Hillary was also incredibly encouraging when I spoke to her back in 2012 to discuss the idea of setting up We Own It. Um, so she's been a wonderful advisor to us since then. No, well, it's been an amazing growth of an organisation from those small beginnings. Yes, thank you. And thanks for joining us. Can you tell us a bit about, we're thinking a lot at the moment about how public ownership can be so wildly successful that it can never be dismantled and this book gives us lots of clues to that and you talk about the top-down state that is a criticism of public ownership how do we counter that criticism and what what do you see as the key ingredients for really successful public ownership well i suppose the key ingredient for me is involving the public and the public as 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 human beings knowledgeable human beings and the public are both the users of public services like you know, the users of the railways who are now so frustrated, the users of water, you know, all those utilities and key services. Um, and the, the users have a lot of knowledge about how they could be improved, what, you know, what they need to be like to meet people's daily needs. And then on the other hand, also the workers who are also, in a way, they're worker citizens. They're, they have families, they live in neighbourhoods, you know, they're part of the public. And I think my main point in this book is that those people, the public, they're not just some abstract mass, you know, some statistic. They're people with knowledge that is sometimes not kind of theorised or studied. It's practical. It's what people call tacit knowledge, things that we know but can't always tell, you know, the kind of things that, that we know about even like basic things like riding a bike that we can't always explain exactly what we're doing, but we do it and we know it. But in daily life, you know, all the daily experiences of mothers dealing with babies, you know, they couldn't write a long, well, they probably could write a long essay about what's needed, but they just know from their experience on railways and the frustration of getting prams on and off and, you know, all the, 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 the frustrations of um, a system that isn't responsive or, 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 or taking account of their needs. So my starting point would be, look, value the, the knowledge, the practical knowledge and the tacit knowledge of the people that work for those services, particularly on the front line, and those who use those services. And if you had a form of management which did that, so it would be the opposite of top down. It would be based on real dialogue, real learning and understanding between users. And in a way, managers would not be giving commands. They would be supporting workers and users to express and share their practical insights and develop out of those that knowledge those insights a better service for all and do you see that as being kind of online offline what are the best processes for capturing all of that tacit knowledge well i think it's got to be built into the way the service is run so um as well as you know involved in the planning of a service but let's start with the way the service is run I mean if the service is run in a in not so much a hierarchical manner where managers maybe you know sitting in London somewhere are kind of basically designing and commanding the nature of services up in um, Tyneside say um, you have you know a basic structure basic standards provided by well, ultimately the politicians on the basis of the election and the manifesto in the election. So that provides basic services about frequency, you know, limiting price and so on. Those have got to be set at some kind of national level, but that's a framework. But then the detail of how services are run, you know, what services um, are provided at what hour, you know, the knowledge of when the rush hour is, of, you know, when mothers are using it, those kind of detailed knowledges. That's all got to be worked out at a local level in a collaborative way with the users and the frontline workers. Mm. And and actually the best organisational forms for that are quite difficult to design in advance. It's not about 
people being on boards. It's about processes of, of actual manning, managing and running a service. So I, th I think I wouldn't be able to kind of set out a you know, plan on paper without you know, having kind of gone on the, the trains there or, you know, and I think in a way that's what would happen, that you'd have maybe workers um, with managers uh, and with some kind of collaboration with users, you know, maybe doing some of the trips and then yeah. coming back and saying, OK, these are the things that strike us that could yeah. be improved. Well, here's what, what a day in the life of a, of a public service. Yes, it was like and how could it be improved. And so quite sort of um, basic sort of nitty gritty knowledge being shared. Yeah. And people would say that's going to that's going to cost too much. How do we do that? efficiently what would you say to well i'd say that you know a lot of cost is incurred by by at the moment not taking account of the knowledge of 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 users you know i mean if you just think of the cost of um you know overcrowded trains you know the time lost the frustrations the stress people arrive at work really stressed really fed up you know and if if there could be a a more you know pleasurable way of getting to work people would be more productive. I mean, that sounds a bit instrumental, but actually the economy would work better yeah. if, if actually time had been put into making the services better and there was time, because that time is important for everyday knowledge to be realised and, and made effective. People need the time to think, to talk, to discuss, to share ideas, to, to criticise, to corroborate. You know, that is going to take time, but I think it's time worth spent. And we often don't measure the time lost by mistakes, by, in a, by, by lack of awareness of people's needs. Um, so I think if we, if we bear that in mind, that hidden cost, mm. then we can actually feel quite proud of enabling people to have the time to express their knowledge of what's needed and what could be done. I mean, also solving problems. Often people on the front line can solve a problem which management at a distance can't do. Yeah, definitely. And people like to solve problems together. You've got a quote in here from um, Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, at the end of the day, human beings want to do things together. We want to do things collectively, which is, which is something that's been missing. I, yeah. I guess something that's in my mind is, although people do want to do that, mm. Sometimes people, I think there's a worry about that democracy does take too much time, mm. that it means endless meetings by consensus, mm. that, you know, people with their busy lives don't have the time to get involved in. Sometimes democracy can attract people who are a bit annoying and just want to talk. What do we do with, with that? Well, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I looked at a, a school in Sweden to kind of, I don't know quite why I chose this. I think it was a school that had been influenced by the women's movement, which is where I think a lot of these ideas about the importance of practical knowledge comes from. And they'd run the school, an adult education school, on a women's school, um, on the basis of this idea of valuing people's practical, not practical knowledge. And there, as I say, that's where I learned this idea of building it into the culture, the way the um, the, the, the classes are run, the teachers behave, and so and the, and the way they value the the insights of their students, um, and so it wasn't. I think it's really important not to reduce democracy to meetings. I mean, and I know Oscar Wilde made this remark about the problem of socialism is it, it miss, you lose too many right. evenings, and I, you know, my evenings are spent well swimming, you know, watching films as much as I often don't want to go to meetings. So I completely sympathise with that. Um, but I want to go to a swimming pool where they're taking account of my yeah. observations and my knowledge of what's needed and how things could be improved. Or, you know, I want to live in an area where my daily knowledge... And that's not always meetings, it's maybe um, just an ability when, when a, a, the housing officer is coming to see you about some problem. That housing officer being alert to you know, what other comments you might have about what's going on in the area, what's, what's wrong with the, the housing provision and so on. So it's like having a public service that's valuing it, the users. I mean, so many public services are actually contemptuous of, of citizens. They're almost seen as a, a problem. You know, if we had nobody to serve, we'd, we'd do a better service. 
So it's seeing, it's seeing the users of services as actually an, a kind of a creative force rather than a problem. Definitely. And how do we create a, a culture of that in public services where maybe there isn't enough attention paid to the users of services or perhaps because of austerity and the, mm. you know, the cuts to public services or perhaps just because that isn't in the culture? How do we start to create Well, that? I think for, for a start, you do have to pay people properly. I think if workers are paid decent wages, then they're going to be less resentful of what they're having to do. And since what they're having to do is mainly delivering services to, in a way, their neighbours, their, their, their families, their, the people they live around, you know, then them being more, you know, feel, feeling that their dignity, their, the, the, you know, their, their very persons are being respected mm. by being properly paid. And their job is valued. The job is valued. Then I think that's the first step. Um, and then I think another step would be that in the kind of measurement of their time and the, the organisation of the work, there was a recognition that time to, you know, let's suppose it's waste disposal, it's, it's the bin men and women. So that their time shouldn't be, you know, just kind of racing to get enough houses covered in a certain time, but actually should include time where they can talk to the the citizens that come out and say, "Oi, you know, you're 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 not coming on the right day," or you know, you leave too much rubbish around, or mm-hmm. you know, people who've got complaints, you know, in a way they shouldn't have to go to the council website and all that sort of thing. Right. I mean, they, they should as an ultimate, ultimate measure. But in the meantime, they should be able to interact with the, the frontline workers. Yeah, it's a public and, facing yeah, service and, and, and that's part and that, of the job. Yes, yeah, so that means their time should be allocated with that in mind. Their pay should be allocated, should be, should be leveled at a level which gives them the respect yeah. to do, feel they can do that kind of thing. And that they're valued, you know. And there could even be a, you know, going above and beyond. So, you know, the neighbour at number, you know, whatever is, hasn't been around, going, yes. could oh, we yeah, go and definitely. check up on her or Yes, I mean, that, I think that applies very much to the postal service where mm. historically, you know, postmen and women have been, you know, bit the eyes and the ears of the neighbourhood. So they've noticed when somebody's not picking up their post. And, you know, th- that's been a very important sort of provision. But now, you know, one of the frustrations of post people now is that they can't do that you know they don't have any relationship with the the people to whom they're delivering the post because they don't have time because they don't have time because it's not valued in the job you know they're told to just do things at double speed so they can't even properly deliver the post because that requires often knowledge of who lives where because the you know envelopes are addressed badly and this sort of thing yeah I know something you're thinking about is popular planning Mm. Can you talk a little bit about that concept in, in, in this context? And in particular, what can we, are there ways that we can use popular planning to help combat climate change? Is that, is that something that you're thinking about at the moment? Yeah, I mean, by planning, I suppose we need to think, I suppose planning is really where you're talking about, um, you know, a whole environment. So you're not just talking about one factory or one neighbourhood. You're talking about how things interconnect, how um, industry interconnects with um, the quality of the air in a neighbourhood or neighbourhood where the industry is based, um, or the connection between transport systems and um, neighbourhoods. And so it's about how things interconnect. And so I think the whole issue of climate change is a very good. Um, case of where a problem affecting everybody, you know, it can only be resolved if there is planning, if people, uh, uh, if, if, if the people kind of designing an industry or designing where it, thinking where it should be based or, you know, wondering whether the product is, is safe, you know, they're thinking about the implications of that for the rest of the environment. So um, I think that needs a popular dimension because it's often people living in an area that know and think through you know what the problem would be I mean when I was working for the Great London Council we worked with people who were resisting the city airport right that was in um, I suppose that would be 80 84 85 yeah. and they were you know they were really concerned because of its noise levels well I mean people in the city 
who hoped to, to use that airport to pop over to clinch a deal in Frankfurt or whatever. Yeah. They really don't give a damn about the noise levels. Mm. So they, working maybe with the company, Ryanair, I think it was Bryman's or something, probably gone out of business now, I'm not quite sure, uh, or Molens, which are the people that constructed it. I mean, they would be negotiating on the basis of their needs. And it wasn't till the people living there said, oi, you know, yeah. this is going to hit us. We might get a few jobs cleaning and stuff, but actually we're more concerned with what it's going to mean for the neighbourhood, the children, you know, it's going to pollute the air, it's going to, um, it's going to cause noise, it's, it's going to be a problem. So we, we then worked with them on an alternative plan for how the docks could be better used. Um, and for that, you know, we really, really drew on the knowledge, including the historical knowledge, you know, of what, what the docks used to be like, what the problems were then, why we can't go back to the old imperial docklands. But but then also why there could be maybe some kind of European, you know, dock aimed at European shipping. And all this knowledge was, was in the community. You know, I'm not saying you don't need then to work with those community activists. You need planners who've got a, a, a knowledge of London as a whole. But you'd need, again, those both those levels of knowledge. What were the, what were the difficulties that you faced in this? Well, the main difficulty, and actually it was in a way also the main reason why we, or one of the reasons why we put such emphasis on working with local people, was that Mrs Thatcher, as part of her, in a way, destruction of the, of the state, of public bodies, she eliminated all um, democratic, all the powers of democratic planning bodies, like the GLC, um, Newham Council, you know, normally would have the right to um, question and have some statutory powers to question and even hold up or block a development like an airport, you know, which completely alters the character of an area. And so the GLC would have had uh, a democratic power over that because it's a strategic issue. Newham Council would have had a democratic power because it's a a local issue affecting um, neighbourhoods and so on and local land. Um, But, but, But Thatcher wanted to see the Docklands developed into really a sort of subsidiary to the city, which is what's happened. Uh, And so she used her, you know, government executive power to get rid of all those democratic powers and to create a company, the London Docklands Development Corporation, which had sole power over, you know, development in that area. So actually, our campaign, you know, had no had no democratic body that could respond to it and so our only you know possibility of influencing the decision was through an inquiry that took place uh, and then we submitted the plan to the inspector I mean present the local people presented it you know in the public inquiry and he was impressed uh, both by the arguments against the airport and by the alternative the fact we had alternatives that could create jobs and he then as a result he he didn't stop the airport, he didn't recommend against it, but he did actually lower the noise levels and met some of the concerns of the, of the local people. But, it, but I think we were left with a really good example of what could be done uh, if you had real democratic powers that could support that more participatory approach to planning. That makes a lot of sense. And you talked in the book about the kind of interplay between institutions and social movements and how both things are necessary Mm. to increase our power Mm. so if and when we have a Labour government that's prepared Mm. to put into action the public ownership that we want to see Mm. what does that what does that look like in practice how do we make sure that the social movements stay involved in the institutions Mm. that they've helped to foster you know that, that if we have a more radical set of politicians in charge mm. that they're linked in with the people that that helped to put them there yes no i think that's a tricky one and and one that a lot of no radical government has really resolved because there is a tendency you know particularly with the radical government by which people you know work to get that government elected and then they kind of say phew you know that's done now you know we'll get the radical policies um but actually as you say i mean 
to get really radical policies, you're up against really significant vested interests. So merely having electoral power, representative power, isn't sufficient. I mean, we know um, from the work of George Monbiot and others how, how much the state has been captured by private corporations and how those corporations, plus the CBI and the city, will work massively to, to block radical policies. Uh, so, in a way, we need to have, or the Labour Party, a Labour government or a Labour left coalition, um, needs to have its own sources of democratic extra-parliamentary power that can challenge that, that influence of corporate, illegitimate, undemocratic, unaccountable extra-parliamentary power. So that's one reason. I mean, how, we, how the movements are kept in in, you know, kept active and things. I mean, it's partly education that we, we need to know that a government, an, an elected left government, isn't going to be able to achieve things on its own. But also education by the politicians. I mean, for me, that's one of the good things about Jeremy Corbyn and Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell's leadership is that their whole emphasis is not, is saying, it's not about a matter of us. I think Corbyn actually says, it's not a matter of me, it's a matter of you, it's a matter of us. And the more that the Labour Party can turn that sentiment into a strategy, the better. I mean, I think it's, a, it's one that isn't completely sort of, it's understood, but it's not yet imbuing the practice of the Labour Party, partly because the pull of electoral necessity is so great, you know, so understandably, the party wants to say, everybody must be involved in the election campaign. But I think my answer, it's not, 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 not saying, I'm not trying to be an armchair advisor, but from my own work in Hackney and um, at a local level, I think that in a way we can, we can sort of combine the two by saying that actually campaigning is not just about going to the doorstep <coughs> sorry, and winning votes. <coughs> it's also about building people's power and confidence. So it's about campaigning. So it's partly the responsibility of groups like We Own It and other campaigns that we work with to make sure that we get the, the results that we want to see. And you've got a quote in here about what happened um, back in 1945 and the sort of hugely strong feeling that there needed to be change. And you say such a radicalisation could not be catalyzed simply from inside the party. Nothing quite like it has occurred since. Um, have you got any ideas on how we really strengthen the popular demand for public ownership so that it feels inevitable and definitely something that should happen? Yes, I mean, <clears throat> I think you're, you're already doing a lot of that, but I think it's different. It's obviously different from the immediate post-war period because that self-confidence was a result of, you know, what people have said called the People's War, you know, the huge effort that just ordinary people went put into winning that war in the production of arms as well as in you know on the front line um, and but I think now in a way that um, you could say that a similar energy is building up first from just people's anger you know anger is a is a kind of you know driving force and a force of energy particularly when it's tied to hope to possibility so I think it's about it's about kind of feeding that anger in an informed way, you know, with the information that that in a way legitimises people's anger. You know, people are right to be angry. And then, in a sense, the, um, the impact of the present Labour leadership, I think, is to give people that hope and sense of a possibility. Um, so the manifesto, I think, was one that gave people confidence and did give people that sort of energy and hope. And then it requires people like we own it to um, turn all that into self-organization into people being organized to get what they want to get, to stop price rises um, to you know stop overcrowded trains so in a way the more there's um, kind of public action the more that'll also spread because in a sense the anger and the sense of possibility it creates the if you like the dry wood and then you're like the sort of the matches that turns that into a real force. And it's going to require you to be quite, or all of us involved in movements, to be quite 
disciplined not to simply rush to the Labour Party to join canvassing. I mean, we should do that, but we should combine it with with local actions, with people helping to get people organised. So when we go round the houses saying to people, will you be voting Labour? Then there should be an emphasis on saying, uh, will you be voting Labour? Labour? These are the reasons to vote Labour. But, you know, um, Jeremy Corbyn isn't going to be able to do it on his own. So we need help in getting organised to put put pressure behind him, you know, so that he's he knows he's got a kind of groundswell of energy and creativity when he takes on the vested interests that are going to block him. Exactly. And that's part of why we're independent from any political party yeah, because no, exactly. you know we, really we can hold them important. to account if and when yeah. Labour gets into government and they want to do yeah. public ownership we can be saying when are you doing it, how are you doing yes, it? Yes and you Let's can be a bit sure more radical right. than they can. Exactly, mm. exactly. Um, so in this book you talk about loads of examples of the solidarity economy and it's really inspiring. Have you got any examples of public ownership in particular that come to mind of things that we should be copying or learning from? Yes, I think um, there's no... I often think about this because obviously it would be much simpler if there was a model that we could say, OK, here you are. But I think there are elements of what we've got to put into a, a more um, coherent model. So the th two or three elements I'd mention is one is Uruguay. I've got a cup here from... Um, uh, kind of in honour of the recent um, president, José Pepe Mujica, who was a very modest, a bit like Jeremy, very modest right. president, who, again, put all the emphasis on what the people could do. Yeah. And what they they did was to um, bring into public ownership all the main utilities, you know, telecoms, water, energy, um, transport. But they didn't just do that. Then they... They, they used that to develop a strategy. So they interconnected those. So they connected, they thought through what would, how could our ownership, our public ownership of telecoms improve educational resources? How could it make tele, you know, broadband and computer facilities and so on available to our schools? Um, and you can think about that in terms of energy and water, that the, all these services are interconnected. Yeah. And so, let, so let's think about them, not just as now they're public, so they're going to bring revenue to the public exchequer, but now they're public, they can be serving social goals. What can we do with that? What can we do with that? So that's one thing. Then the, another example is, um, but you know, the, in Uruguay, they still haven't really addressed how to democratise them, you know, with the unions and the users, but they're open to that. Okay. Um, and the unions are beginning to think, how can they take that opportunity up? So it's quite a top-down model at the moment? It's quite a top-down model, yeah. So, I mean, there I'm not saying it's like a complete model. Yeah. It's, but this element of integration is yeah. crucial. Yeah. Another uh, example where another, there's another element that's important is in Paris, where the water has been brought back into public ownership, as I think your website uh, stresses, and where certainly the TNI has made, you know, promoted that fact very heavily. Um, and there they have a, um, they've set up a body called the, um, a water observatory, which involves citizens in scrutinising, you know, the delivery of the water and the quality of the water. Now, that's a really good idea where you have a, a public transparent observatory, which in a way is backed up by, you know, legal political rights to know, to have all the papers, documents, scientific Completely information completely available to the citizens so they can also debate it and argue. You know, but on the other hand, I don't think the, the workers are very involved in the running of the company or the trade unions. All I'm saying there is, again, it's like one key element that we must learn from. Yeah. So I think that there's no one model. Yeah. There's just elements of different models. I think also the, there's a public bank in um, Costa Rica that has a very participative structure. So I think we've got to be quite um, sort of selective rather than go starry-eyed looking for one simple model. Okay. And what's great about the banking costume? Um, I'm not quite sure in detail, at least I'm not sure enough to, to sort of talk about it, but I know they have a sort of assembly of, of both citizens and workers and neighbourhoods to discuss the goals of the bank. Yeah. So the goals of the bank are treated as being social goals. It's a public bank, 
so that they're, they're concluding that therefore there must be public involvement in setting its goals. Yeah. So they've got a participatory assembly that determines that. Yeah, fantastic. One area where the public and users and workers can get together to mm. improve things is the example you talked about in the book of uh, Newcastle and the IT oh, yeah. service, which I know you've um, done much more about in your in your other book. Mm. Um, uh, can you tell us? Can you take us through the story of what happened in Newcastle's IT service and how workers and the public um, came together to improve it? And yeah. also, how can we have examples like Newcastle happening everywhere? Yes, no, that's a question I ask myself. So basically, um, it was in, I think the late eighties when in many places um, IT services were being privatised. Partly councillors, it was like back of office, so it wasn't there were no photo ops in IT services. So councillors kind of didn't care. And they thought, well, if we can make gain funds here or cut costs here, that can benefit frontline services. And in Newcastle, the IT services were very, very old fashioned. You know, they were sort of a bit like the old James Bond film, sort of moving tapes, you know, sort of really, really old fashioned. And the cost was enormous. And I talked to a councillor, quite a senior councillor, and he said, yeah, yeah, we just nodded it through. So there was no, no democratic pressure, really, coming from the councillors to, 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 to um, address the cost problem. Um, anyway, the management could see this. But at that time, management was being very, um, very under attack from, you know, the Prime Minister at the time, Tony Blair, who would sort of say public managers, the public sector is kind of you know, inefficient and they're all hopeless. So management were feeling very, you know, demoralised. And um, meanwhile, BT really had its eye on the North East, you know, which has got a lot of um, urban, you know, um, urban municipalities and thought and, and liked the idea of getting a contract. So they moved in quite quickly and, and, and basically offered to take over the services and management thought, yeah, yeah, that, let's get rid of it. Let's throw the problem over the fence to the private sector. But the unions said, hang on a minute, actually, you know, it's us that work with these systems. We know they're inefficient. We've been trying to say so, but we also know how they could be different. So there'd been a history of a good relation between management and unions in fighting private procurement under Thatcher by making the sort of specification of contracts have enough social requirements that actually a lot of private companies couldn't match what the public sector could deliver. So the, the unions got together and, and pooled their practical knowledge because in a way the other thing about a union as a, as a means of sharing practical knowledge is that they have an overview. You know, increasingly local government was getting cut up, fragmented, subcontracted. But they were working across the, the local, local authority and could see the whole way in which the IT systems were working across the system. So they knew. So they developed a sort of alternative proposal. And then they, ma they won management to, you know, who could see its benefits. Uh, and they used their bargaining power to get all the information, which BT was being given on a plate anyway. And then they, they actually insisted on seeing BT's plans, mm -hmm. which you know gave a lot of confidence to some of the shop stewards that I interviewed. I sort of reconstructed it after. I mean, yeah. And they said, well, yeah, when we saw their plans, we knew we could do much better. Because yeah. actually we know the stuff yeah, in a way they exactly. don't. Anyway, so they then campaigned their big demonstration. So it was a mixture of campaigning, industrial bargaining, and then the sharing of knowledge. And in the end, they won. The, the, the council said, OK, you know, no privatisation unless there's absolutely no alternative. And we'll, we'll um, look at the public bid, I, you know, from the management and the unions, but with the backing of the council. So it was an in-house, what's called technically an in-house bid. And in the end, that won. And then for, I think, about, about nine years, the unions and management worked together to improve the efficiency of the system which, you know, was massively improved and a huge amount of money in the millions was saved. But instead of that money going to the coffers of BT, it went directly to frontline services, adult, elderly care and, and young people's <coughs> services. So that was a product of really um, a 
public sector union that was already quite democratic and participatory and led by <clears throat> people who'd actually been involved not just in unions but also in community organising. I think one of the leaders had been an adventure playground worker and had been working on housing from a tenant's point of view. So there's a kind of a strong community feeling. Um, and also a public management that was very, you know, had a strong public service ethic, you know, yeah. because it was a region where, you know, there's a lot of Geordie pride. So there was a lot of unity between the unions and public sector management, you know, on that kind of belief in their city yeah. basis. Yeah. So the Fantastic. conditions for spreading that, <clears throat> I mean, a lot depends on the union. So I would say... You know, the unions need, if they want to see really democratic, effective public ownership, they need to become increasingly, um, you know, ambitious, going beyond their purely defensive remit, which is, I mean, I can understand it's difficult because they've been on the defensive for so long, you know, against yeah. austerity cuts, you know, all the different consequences of Thatcherism and then Blairism. Blatcherism. Mm -hmm. um, but so it's difficult, but it has to be done in a way. The possibility of a new government with a, a new agenda of public, public ownership, public efficiency should stimulate the unions to really change track yeah. and move beyond the defensive to a kind of positive valuation of their own members as a source of alternatives. And then start developing the alternatives now. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the lesson from Newcastle. They didn't wait for a Labour government. Yeah. They said, we've got to stop it now and we've got to develop the alternatives now. Yeah. And if there is a Labour government, great. But let's, you know, I mean, then there was a hope, you know, but now there's a very strong possibility. So the unions, in my opinion, have no excuse not to go into this very positive sort of way. I think also it'll help elect a Labour government, you know, if the unions are actually putting forward alternatives, none of the sort of Tory attacks on unions as being, you know, defensive and anti the public interest would, will wash. People will think, actually, my union's fighting for our neighbourhood, fighting for our, our needs. Yeah. So I think there's a, it's a win-win yeah. possibility. Yeah, definitely. Final question. Um, what are your three favourite public services? Okay, um, so I think I've just come from uh, Glasgow, uh, so I've had a long train journey, including a train journey from the underground on, on then the overground. And I think transport would be my first one. I mean, I think it's been really battered under, the, under Thatcher and then Blair and all this. He didn't reconstruct a proper public system, so prices are dreadful. Um, but, um, I mean, living in London, the overground and the underground and how they're integrated is fantastic. And the Freedom Path, now I'm over, well, I'm 70. So I'm, you know, I'm really grateful for the Freedom Path. Well, not grateful because we, in a way, we fought for it. We wanted it. Um, and the pensioners movement um, before I became a pensioner was really strong. So that whole overground, underground system. And then potentially the national, you know, railway system. Um, so transport is the first and then I'd say the NHS both the hospitals and the GP system again I, I've just seen its potential I mean at, at present it's under huge pressure but I um, broke my arm about um, eight months ago and had experience briefly in the US mm -hmm. and then came with great relief to Homerton A&E. Did you break it in the US? Yeah I broke it in oh, New no. York yeah, on their pavements. <laughs> So a double <laughs> negative whammy. So then I, ha I had to pay for my first consultation. You know, nobody saying, you know, how are you? It's just like, have you got um, insurance? No. Can you pay? You know, and then having to sign forms, signing away all responsibility, you know, on them. Wow. And then the contrast, getting back to London, going to A&E at like midnight because, you know, I got back very late. And they were like, you know, how are you? What are you feeling? You know, a cup of tea, you know, and then immediate, you know, no expense share, uh, spared kind of treatment. You know, you might have got, yeah, you got a break, you, but you might have got your shoulder blade broken. So we need to do a, mm. a scan. And then, you know, well, the radiologists here are off, but we've got a link with a public hospital in 
Australia. So we're sending the, the x-rays over oh. to Australia. And, you know, luckily I haven't broken my shoulder blade, but uh, and then really good treatment in, you know, all the sort of um, out of outpatient sort of treatment of, of the hospital. Uh, yeah, of the arm. Uh, <clears throat> so that's great, but it's <coughs> it's a hospital under pressure. Mm. So there's a danger of it being downgraded and and that's happening to a lot of really good hospitals. So. But it's the, it, the potential is there, and also I've got a really good GP in Crouch End, and and um, <clears throat> and she's fantastic, and 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 you know just that regular service, that regular availability. So, but again, all the pressures on GPs, meaning long waiting lists, which just un completely incompatible with good health and good monitoring of your health and yeah. long term sort of prevention. Definitely. And thirdly. I suppose for me, I mean, I think obviously education is important, but I'm, you know, I'm past education, I could say, but uh, or past, you know, the institutions. I hope I'm still learning. But um, so I'd say parks and and swimming pools, and um, so again, well, there's the wonderful Victoria Park near where I live, and that's run by the local council and is pretty fantastic, and pretty well maintained, uh, and very accessible, very open. Um, and well cared for and then swimming pools I think you know there's not enough public swimming pools it's not really recognized as a I mean I know I'm a bit extreme but I would say it should be a public right Definitely. everybody everybody should be able to get access to a swimming pool yeah preferably a lido heated lido exactly <laughs> but, exactly you know definitely so that those are my three fantastic that's wonderful thank you so much for, for joining us today. It's been a wonderful discussion. Oh, and I've I feel enjoyed like it too. We've really kind of got into the nitty gritty of how participatory public ownership would work. So really grateful for you talking now to me. Now we must make it happen. Exactly.